know those days when you find yourself dancing, semi-naked in your own back garden for the entertainment of a group of complete strangers? Today was such a day. I am a private detective. A retired private detective. When I awoke that Saturday morning, there was no way I could have predicted the events that would transpire before sundown, the living nightmare that was about to commence. My actual dream had been strange enough. I had been attending an illegal panda fight in an abandoned industrial unit on the outskirts of Frankfurt. My wife Susan snoring woke me up just as my boy Chi Chi was about to deliver the killer blow to his opponent and claim his bamboo shoot reward. I turned to Susan, who was in the midst of her own dream, probably about picking the green bits out of a slice of bread or something. Susan's not the most imaginative of women, even when in slumber. I sat myself up on the edge of the bed and inserted my feet into a pair of fleece-lined slippers liberated from an all-inclusive Fuerteventurian Venturian hotel in 2014. As a norm, I wouldn't approve of footwear theft, but these were the spoils of war following a week-long conflict against a contender for the Canary Islands' surliest chambermaid. She was a squat little hobbit of a woman, like a fire-damaged cranky. Hostilities commenced after I reported to the front desk that I believed that a third party had used our shower. My suspicions arose after I discovered a pubic clump in the shower tray, which wasn't mine, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't Susan's. I asked Susan if I could carry out an inspection to verify my hunch, but she point-blank refused, so I had to go from memory. For the remainder of our vacation, I became the target of a number of covert assaults. When we left our beach towels to dry on the balcony, why was it only ever mine that the wind blew onto the balcony below, leading to a series of tense exchanges with a party of obnoxious Derby County supporters? Why was it that the bookmark in my copy of the Maltese Falcon on the bedside cabinet seemed to move to random pages seemingly of its own accord? And whilst the towel on Susan's bed was sculpted into the shape of a swan every day, mine seemed to take on an increasingly phallic appearance as the vacation progressed. So, if I was provoked into taking a pair of carpet slippers, the cost of which would have to be deducted from her wages, and hopefully lead to her dismissal, then I hope it's understandable. Susan suggested that the slippers may have been complimentary anyway, but I think she is mistaken. I rose and parted the drapes. The sun was already high in the sky. It was a hot one and was gonna get hotter. Kirkwood had predicted as much yesterday. Hot enough to fry an egg on the sidewalk, apparently. If you were to attempt that in this neighborhood, you'd be fighting for floor space with discarded hubba bubba. Our bedroom overlooked the rear garden. I surveyed my estate. Sure, the swing seat needed some TLC, and Susan's hotchpotch collection of garden ornaments were a distraction. In what situation would Buddha find himself sitting at a toadstool table alongside Mr. Toad, a brace of cherubim, and a collection of gnomes, one of whom was disrespectfully bearing his butt cheeks at the enlightened one? Buddha seemed to find it amusing enough, though. But otherwise, the garden was looking good. Bees were keeping themselves busy in the flower bed, and butterflies fluttered over the lawn. I smiled in satisfaction at the symmetrical design I'd created when mowing the grass yesterday. Damn, nothing gives me satisfaction like mowing that lawn of mine, except maybe vacuuming out the car. Then I saw something. Something that made my blood run cold. 
There, sitting brazenly in the dead center of my beautiful, beautiful lawn, was a perfectly formed mound of deep brown plop. I felt sick. The bliss of my idyllic morning had been shattered. Real life had administered a swift kick to the nuts. My garden had been violated. But from where and what did these dirty doings originate? We'd had problems of this nature in the past with a local cat, and it might shock you, but if I'd had a gun, I'd have happily shot the little bastard. Luckily for Tiddles, I'd had my firearms license revoked some years previously, but that's another story. Any cat that had managed to produce a curly joe of these proportions was a cat that needed veterinary assistance, and fast. No, this was no cat. A dog? The only dog in the immediate vicinity was a three-legged mongrel that belonged to Wobbledy Clark from the flats at the back, and for it to scale the large concrete wall with its broken glass garnish that separated us from the flats in order to take a dump would take a determination and dexterity that I doubt a tri-limbed canine could muster. At that moment, my next-door neighbour appeared in his back garden to empty potato peelings into his compost bin. He caught my eye. Lovely morning. I smiled and nodded in return. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was something about this guy that I didn't like. He had one of those big unruly beards that were once only seen on open university lecturers and hunger strikers, but now seemed to adorn the chins of everyone from premiership footballers to supermarket trolley collectors. This guy apparently worked for a housing authority and walked to work, walked mind, not drove, Wearing a duffel coat and carrying a satchel, he looked like a 70s child off to fly a kite near some pylons. Yeah, he was a piece of work, all right. I noticed that he was looking over the fence at my lawn, directly at the rogue's stool. A smile played on his lips. Could it be his? No, surely not. Why would a person do that on another man's property? Maybe it's a sex thing? The guy certainly had a sexual appetite. I knew he'd had relations with at least two separate women. I know this because I'd heard them. And I know they were different broads because the first one made a low grunting noise and the second one sounded like an asthmatic wood pigeon. But did this make him the kind of sicko who got his kicks curling one out in his neighbor's garden? My God! This is the sort of thing you could read about if you dug deep enough on the internet, but here, literally in my backyard? His smile had contorted into a twisted grimace. He raised his hand to wave at me, but the gesture could have been interpreted as an admission of guilt. Yeah, I waved back, but unbeknown to him, behind the curtain my other hand had raised its middle finger defiantly in his direction. Unbeknown to me, Susan had now woken up and saw my monodigit salute. What are you doing, you dirty pig? I'm the dirty pig? Wait till she saw what this dirty pig had done. <sighs> Susan could be of a confrontational disposition in the mornings, especially if there was still any of the previous evening's Pinot Grigio still in her system. If she spotted the poo pile, then our neighbor would be the recipient of a tsunami of foul-mouthed abuse. He wouldn't be the first one to find themselves on the receiving end of such a tirade as the elderly charity worker who came a knock in just as Megan and Harry were exchanging vows can testify. If my conclusions were correct, which I believe they were, then he deserved no less than such a four-letter onslaught, but I could personally do without the aggro. I had to remove the Todd before she saw it. Luckily, Susan always spent the first ten minutes of the day scrolling through social media on her phone, catching up with the latest half-baked political views and greeting card-level philosophies of the online intelligentsia. There wasn't a second to spare. I had to move fast. I donned my bathrobe, which I had obtained following an altercation on a Pembrokeshire mini-break, but I hadn't time to dwell on that right now. I fled downstairs under the pretense that I was going to make Susan a cup of tea. Using the boiling kettle as an audible subterfuge, I slowly slid open the patio doors and headed outside into the back garden to face my fetal foe.
As soon as I stepped onto the lawn, I felt the wet grass beneath my feet. Damn, these slippers were of a poor quality. Perhaps the stumpy chambermaid had got the last laugh after all. I passed the terracotta garden residence, noticing a dew-coated spider web strung betwixt Buddha's bald head and the gnome's exposed buttocks. I don't know which one this guy was supposed to be, but he certainly wasn't bashful. No, those were dwarfs, not gnomes. Can you still say dwarf? Oh, for God's sake, man, focus, you've got a job to do. I opened the garden shed to get tooled up. I took a trowel to tackle the troublesome turd. Enough with the tongue twisters already. I thought I told you to focus. Time is of the essence. I slowly approached my quarry, glistening in the morning dew like a filthy Fabergé. I attempted to understand the mind of the perpetrator of the poop. Was this the act of somebody who was off their brain on wacky weed or trippy tablets? My neighbor certainly had many of the attributes that you associate with narcotic users. The aversion to shaving, the suspiciously upbeat personality, the playing of freaky music. This guy didn't listen to normal singers like Buble or Cullum. His record collection consisted of what I call drug music. Marley, Hendrix, Sheeran. But no, our unwanted new garden ornament sat in the dead center of the lawn. This wasn't the frenzied action of a deranged junkie. This was designed and premeditated. This was the work of a sober, yet very sick individual. This was a sock. One of my own brown socks, complete with a small yellow design on the side, which, from a distance, I had assumed were pieces of sweet corn. I must have dropped it when I brought the washing in the previous day. It wasn't the product of a deranged mind. It was a product of Primark. I held the ersatz excrement up on the tip of my trowel. What a putz I felt. I placed the sock in the pocket of my pajama pants, an action I immediately regretted as it was still sopping wet. I turned to head back towards the house and caught sight of my neighbor standing at an open window. <laughs> he was laughing hysterically. He must have witnessed the whole sorry affair and was now reveling in my humiliation. This was almost as reprehensible as if he had snipped one off on my back long. Well, no, maybe not that bad, but he was still being a prize asshole. <laughs> Tears of mirth ran down my neighbor's cheeks as he continued to laugh in my direction. So once more, I aimed my middle finger in his direction. This time I made sure he saw it. There was no curtain for it to hide behind this time. It was out, and it was proud. The smirk drained from my tormentor's face. It was replaced by a look of confusion, followed by distress, and then perhaps a little anger. It was only then that I noticed the mobile phone that he was holding up to his ear. The content of his telephone conversation must have been the cause of his mirth. I quickly retreated to the house and made Susan's cup of tea. It had not been a good start to the day. I was hungry, hungry for food. It had been three hours since I had mechanically eaten my Otibix, awaiting the inevitable hammering on the front door from my neighbor. I only began to relax after seeing him head out in his car mid-morning. Seems although he's happy to flaunt his green credentials to his workmates during the week, on weekends he races around town in his gas-guzzling, air-polluting box of death. Oh, no. He's got a hybrid. Well, of course he has. I was lunching alone as Susan was meeting her sister Judith at this little place we know, Sainsbury's. I opened the refrigerator. There was an unopened packet of turkey ham. 
I check the expiry date, then I check today's date on my watch. You guessed it, if this ham was ever gonna be eaten, it was now or never. I've got this reputation as an unpredictable maverick, but even I wasn't crazy enough to eat a whole pack of turkey ham on its own. No, I needed two slices of bread to sandwich the meat and create a, a sandwich, a ham sandwich. I headed over to the bread bin and lifted the lid. Inside lay a solitary slice of bread. Suddenly, a shockwave of trauma reverberated through my entire body as I was instantly taken back to the brief period of time when we were the owners of a sunbed. I had once lifted the lid with the intention of giving Susan a sexy surprise, but instead I was faced with the naked form of her sister Judith. The sight of the thick white slice had given me an hallucinatory flashback. Even the green flecks of mold on the bread reminded me of the incident, as Judith is a heavily varicose lady. Wait. Green flecks of mold? The dream that I had imagined that Susan was having this morning had come into fruition. This wasn't the first time that I'd suspected that I might be able to experience psychic premonitions, that I was a seer. Though, after the sock plop episode, I was beginning to have doubts about my gift. This decomposing remnant of a once proud loaf needed to be put out of its misery. I tossed it into the trash can, and with it went any dreams I'd had of having a sandwich. I searched through the kitchen cabinets for culinary inspiration when I stopped in my tracks as I spotted the unmistakable jazzy packaging of Ainsley Harriet's spicy couscous, the face of the celebrity chef himself benevolently gazing down on me like a gurning savior. Hello, old friend. I had a flash of inspiration. What if I was to cut up the ham slices and mix them in with the couscous? Hmm, that might just work. I read the cooking instructions on the size of the couscous packet. Place in microwavable bowl and heat for five to six minutes. The question was, did I have five to six minutes to spare? Sure I did. I had all the time in the world. It was 24 degrees and counting. Was Kirkwood ever wrong? I was now fed, thanks to Ainsley. I was enjoying my coloring book in the back garden. I'd asked Susan to get me one of those adult coloring books that are all the rage at the moment, but instead she got me a Star Wars Angry Birds one, as it was on offer. I completed an avian Carrie Fisher to my satisfaction and decided to slip up my Fruit of the Loom polo shirt and catch some rays. I drifted off into a deep sleep. I began having a vague, unfathomable couscous-induced dream. Susan and I were parasailing naked over the Mendips. It was beautiful. Transcendental. Why did Susan smell of fried onions? Susan and I fell into a tailspin of confusion as my senses were bombarded by a combination of jabbering voices, loud music, smoke and hot meat fumes. I woke to find my neighbor holding an impromptu barbecue. I found a gap in the fence to observe proceedings. The guests were mainly my neighbor's friends, all of whom seemed to possess ridiculous comedy beards. It looked like a Pat Roche convention was in town. Also present were a smattering of neighbors. Dave and Julie Bishop, the Featherstones, old Bob Cooper, the Orange Widow from number 38. That man who would once had his hard drive removed by the police? Hell, the whole neighborhood seemed to be invited. Even Wobbly Clark was there. And that guy shouts at ashtrays. Everyone was there. Everyone except me and Susan. These people looked up to me. I was a big noise in the community, and I was being shouldered out by this goofball, this usurper. I needed to get into this barbecue and show this kid how the land lay in these parts. Fortuitously, at that moment, a seagull that had been greedily surveying a tray of brioche baps from overhead decided to drop its load, which landed directly into a bowl of potato salad. I took this as my opportunity to address the gathering. Hey guys, I shouted. It looks like an uninvited guest has just added an extra ingredient to your side salad. 
A hairy face turned to look in my direction, then another, then another, until the whole throng were looking my way. But they weren't looking at my face. They were all staring in wonder at my exposed midriff. I knew immediately what had caught their attention. It was my appendectomy scar, which was unique to say the least. Oh, sweet mother, what the hell is that? It was the orange widow who broke the silence. She had broken off from trying to seduce a ridiculously hirsute guy with a tattooed throat and horn-rimmed spectacles, and was now pointing her hastily varnished talons at my torso. They say that in her younger days that she was a beauty, but she now resembled Rick Parfit in a hall of mirrors. This? I got this in Nam, honey. This wasn't entirely true. I had had to undergo an emergency appendix removal whilst on a cruise stop over in Laos. It was only afterwards that I was informed that my surgeon was actually only qualified as a dental hygienist. Jesus, it looks like one of Mr. Tickle's arms. The beardy blasphemer certainly had a point. It was unorthodox, all right. A crowd had now gathered at the fence to get a closer look at this anomaly, which my neighbor didn't like one little bit. I should come away from him. He's a dick. This guy had a smart mouth, but I could match him. I'm a dick, all right. But I know you mean it as a term of course abuse. But dick is also a common abbreviation for private detective, which was my profession in a previous life. No, you weren't. You're a salesman or something. The peroxide pensioner's words weren't entirely untrue. I'd never actually been employed to investigate suspected adulterers or fly tippers, nor had I ever received any payment for my services. It was more of a public duty. Being a PI was my true calling. My 35 years in polyethylene sales had been more of a subterfuge than a career. A repetitive refrain claiming that it was all about the bass started playing, and I began to rhythmically move my belly from side to side to the music. The onlookers lapped it up. Look, Mr. Tickle's waving, I said, and I found myself performing an unchoreographed belly dance for my enthralled audience. I altered my gyrations to suit the change in tempo. My neighbor stood alone, slowly turning his artisan sausages, green with envy that all eyes were on me. Any thoughts of burgers and chicken wings were now forgotten as all of my neighbor's guests were now feasting their eyes on my performance and I had them eating out of the palm of my hand. All apart from a breakaway splinter group that had gravitated towards Wobbly Clark who was in the process of scaling the north face of my neighbor's shed. My neighbor had lost control of his own barbecue. He was now slumped into a deck chair seeking solace in his smartphone and a tin of the Orange Widow strong cider. My routine was just reaching a crescendo when I was interrupted by the sound of my doorbell ringing. I left my disappointed crowd calling for an encore as I went to answer the door. I felt as if I was walking on air as I made my way through the house. This is how Ashley Banjo must feel every night. I grabbed the Tintern Abbey souvenir tea towel to wipe down my sopping torso and pits. The heat had been unrelenting and I'd built up a terrific sweat. I answered the door to a parcel delivery guy, adorned with the obligatory skin stenciled forearms of the working class male. He was delivering some flip flops that Susan had ordered from a website that sells shoes for women with big feet. He too did a double take when he saw my appendix scar. Oh my god, what happened to you mate? Sorry buddy, you should have been here 10 minutes ago. Show's over for today. The guy looked bemused. I remembered that he'd had no knowledge of the afternoon's proceedings. I'd been entertaining the troops with a topless barbecue boogie. I autographed his handheld etch-a-sketch and he quickly retreated to his van. Me, I headed off to take a shower. This was a ludicrous level of perspiration. The party had broken up soon afterwards. The Orange Widow was the last to stagger out, escorted home by that man who had once had his hard drive removed by the police. I made a note of the time in case I was ever asked to recall it by the Crime Watch team. Susan returned laden with shopping bags. I wondered if she bought me any more coloring books. I hear good things about the Paw Patrol one. 
Susan entered the room with a face like holy thunder. What the ruddy hell have you been up to? Um, I ate an entire pack of turkey ham all by myself. I'm not sure why this was the only thing that sprung to mind given the day's events. I've got some videos to show you. Susan thrust her phone at me. When Susan usually made me look at videos on her phone, I feigned interest as the grandchildren of people I didn't know fell off beanbags or people that she used to work with danced at weddings. My heart sank and I fought the urge to throw up as my image appeared on the small screen, shaking what my mama gave me for all the world to see. However, this is not the music I'd been dancing to. This is not the music I had been dancing to. There was a second video with the footage sped up, accompanied by a comedic soundtrack, my shirtless form flailing like a tasered street drunk. So this is what my neighbor had been doing with his smartphone. In my long career, I had prided myself on my ability to keep my anonymity, but he had now made me an internet sensation, like a skateboarding goose or a radical cleric. My videos were receiving hit after hit, and I felt every one of them as if they were aimed at my now infamous physique. I had gone viral. I was trending. Hashtag Michael Fatley. A clever play on words. Hashtag Arthur Scargut. Not so good and downright cruel. I mean, come on. I was about to curse my neighbor once more when Susan shot me a look that made me see the reality of my situation in HD clarity. I had no one to blame but myself. There comes a time in a man's life, after falsely imagining that a blameless individual had purposely defecated on his lawn, proceeding to flip the innocent party the bird whilst reclaiming a rogue sock, and then hijacking their barbecue by exploiting an unfortunate physical deformity for the entertainment of the other's guests, when that man has got to eat a large helping of humble pie with a dollop of whipped cream, or gravy. I don't think the argument as to whether humble pie is a sweet or savoury dish has ever been fully settled. Are you coming? Susan had read my mind. It was time to head next door and declare a truce. Put a shirt on first. I think we've all seen enough of that. I put my polo shirt back on and followed Susan towards the door. She'll calm down later once she's paraded around the house in her new open toe clown shoes. I'd have to swallow being today's online troll fodder. It'll be someone else's turn tomorrow. Some dumb putts trying to negotiate an escalator on a space hopper or whatever. As I headed out into the street, I glanced at my sock drying on the radiator. Do you ever have days when you wish you'd stayed in bed? You have been listening to The Retired Private Detective. Written and performed by M.J. Price with additional voices by Jacqueline Appley Keith Appley and Matthew Price edited and produced by Keith Appley with music from the Nat Music Library